Okay, it's uh, 7.03. Um, we'll call the December 14th uh, Selectman's meeting to order. Um, the, as, uh, we'll go right to amendments to the agenda. Um, we have one amendment. Um, we we're going to uh, let David Levesque talk about the, uh, give us some updates on the broadband committee if everyone's okay with that. Anyone else have any other um, any other amendments to the agenda? All right. Oh, just uh, uh, Joel, just a very quick executive session for real right. estate. Yeah, we'll have an executive session at the end. Um, very quick, very quick. So we'll move uh, David to 4.1 um, and uh, take it away, David. Let us know what's going on. Well, right to 4.1. Okay, cool. Um, well, I thought since uh, you folks appointed the committee on November 9th, I would update you on what has happened. We had a flurry of activity. Uh, you may recall when we came to see you on um, uh, November 9th, that uh, we uh, not only were requesting to be appointed as a committee, but to have permission to pursue a planning grant um, for broadband uh, um, build out. And um, we, after we had approval for that, we met many times uh, feverishly and were able to submit a um, grant request on the 20th um, a short um, 11 days later. And um, we just found out on December 4th that there were 11 applicants uh, for the planning grant and we were not denied. Uh, we were asked to submit supplemental information on two areas of our application, one being the project focus and one being the financial um, budget and commitments of it all. So we've been working the last uh, couple of days to put that together. That is due uh, by the 21st. So we're still in the running, which is a positive sign. And um, uh, it's great how we're working together as a committee. And I want to uh, mention to you that we're having tremendous support from the Allen Institute and uh, Mary Ellen's uh, Lincoln County Regional Planning Commission. They've been uh, tremendous helps in this process and uh, they've uh, expressed an interest in helping us uh, going forward as well. And I wouldn't know what to do without them. Um, so thank you, Mary Ellen and the Allen Institute there. So um, that's basically it. I just wanted to give you a quick update and answer any questions you have. I did just uh, post we try to record all of our meetings uh, since they are on Zoom. And I don't think we had them all, but I put a bunch of them through my client portal and uh, gave the committee, including John and Brian access to get those. So if you need to see any of the uh, recorded meetings or our uh, final application, it's all there uh, and you can easily pull it up. The videos are sort of heavy, so uh, I think going through the client portal was the best way to share that information. Um, but uh, you can easily see that there. And if anybody else on the board wants access, I can just put in your email address and grant you that access directly so John doesn't have to copy it and try to get it to you. <laughs> Although I'm sure he would have fun doing that. <laughs> so our plan is, is to submit the um, uh, supplemental information. I suspect by the end of the year, we should have um, a word whether or not we've been approved. We originally asked for 7,500 for the grant. They came back and suggested we drop it down to five. Um, so uh, we've done that. And um, I'm hoping that's a, a sign that if we just provide a little bit more detail, we could get that um, that grant level. And I think that should be sufficient if we have a lot of in-kind in contributions um, uh, that we would worry about soliciting, soliciting or finding um, if we get the, the 5,000 to work with. So I would uh, answer any questions you may have. Does anyone have any questions? 
Well, great. That makes my job easy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll continue on and I will um, uh, hope to come back uh, maybe on the 28th and give a positive update. But either way, I will uh, keep you informed of what we're doing. All right. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you and have a good evening all. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, 4.2, which is the community development block grant policy review. And I'll turn that over to Mary Ellen Barnes. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm glad I had the pleasure of sending you some interesting reading the other day. Um, so, so these several resolutions and policies are required as part of any community development block grant. All across the country, communities are adopting these. Now, most of these are all speak to things that you're already doing, equal employment, um, avoiding conflict of interest, fair housing policies. So um, it's not really obligating you to, to have a proactive program around any of these topics. Um, but, but they do need to be adopted by the board and, and, and signed either by the board or, and or by, by uh, John. So uh, we'll work with you to do that. But I'm happy to go through these one by one um, or to, to answer your questions um, that you may have. Do you want to just, just give, us, give us an overview and, and sure. start with that? Yep. So, so one of them, the obvious one, is equal employment opportunity. You, you folks, you know, do not uh, discriminate when you when you're hiring people, right? You always have that EEO um, uh, ad at the or icon at the bottom of your ads. Um, so basically, we're just recognizing your responsibilities to to be treating people fairly, and that's the equal opportunity policy statement. Let's see if I get all the names right. So you can test me at the end if I goof up here. But and then standards of conduct. So that means that the way you spend the money, um, you're avoiding conflict of interest. If you needed to, you would bid out the process, but that's not what we're doing with this particular grant. Um, you're gonna be monitoring it. You know, John and his crew over there at the office is gonna be paying attention to how this money hits the general fund um, as a contract gets, uh, gets created in a, little, in a couple of weeks. And then you're gonna be just monitoring the spending of, of that. Um, so it's really just doing the best financial reporting and monitoring that you do already as a town. Um, then the fair housing resolution, um, it says that uh, the town of uh, Newcastle doesn't discriminate in, in the sale, rental, leasing, financing, or housing of land or of land to be used for the construction of housing. Now, you're not doing housing, but they want you to adopt a policy that says you're, you're avoiding all kinds of uh, uh, discrimination uh, with respect to that. Um, and then I think John and I talked through a fair housing self-assessment, which is, uh, I'm sorry, they didn't number the pages and neither did I. But anyway, we went through various questions. Uh, for example, to the best of your knowledge, has the community been involved in any complaints regarding uh, housing discrimination? And so we said no. Um, and has your community adopted a fair housing program to help citizens become aware of, the, of their rights? And when you pass these things tonight, you will have adopted a fair housing program. Um, and uh, just some other factual things. Does the community contain any subsidized housing units? Um, do you maintain a database at the town office that tracks residents by, by race, by income? And you don't, and we don't want to do that, right? right? So, so we're sort of just saying, you're not setting up anything in the town office that would lead anyone to think that you are discriminating against, against folks. Um, and then is public transportation available? Um, does your community contain any housing for the handicap? And as far as I know, you don't. Um, and uh, a few other factual items around fair housing and self-assessment. So happy to answer more specific questions. Then we get into ADA. So that's called section 504, just for anyone who's keeping track of sections and federal regulations, but it's called section 504. So. With John, I went through and answered questions about whether you discriminate against anyone with disabilities regarding employment um, and access to your facilities. Um, these are the issues that, that, that really are relevant to Newcastle. You're not putting on any programs. Um, so I had a lot of not applicable answers to those questions if you took a look at those. And then with respect to the facilities, we're sort of saying, um, in terms of people getting into buildings, getting around the space, getting into bathrooms, 
um, that for the most part, your facilities are ADA compliant. Um, I, I, it's possible that the Harriet uh, Bird Clubhouse could use some uh, different, you know, different accommodations, but that's something for you to consider, you know, in the down the road. We're just trying to sort of evaluate where you are with, with um, handicapped accessibility. Um, and then uh, in, a, in a piece of paper that, again, it's not really relevant to you, but it's part of our package is called Residential Anti-Displacement and Relocation Assistance Plan. So this is not relevant to what you're doing, but it's sort of saying, and again, this can live for some years ahead. So if you adopt this and next year apply for something else, these policies that you adopt um, are, are, are good, 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 good for a few years at least. So this is saying, if you're doing housing for low-income people, which is what HUD and, and CDBG is mostly about, you're not displacing low-income people to create new units and then not making accommodations for those folks to come back into equal or better units. So it's a stretch of what your responsibilities are with this current grant. And it's just one of those documents that's required. It has really no relevance to uh, what you're doing with um, Split Rock uh, for the next few months. So. Again, it's just part of my job to uh, confound your 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 evening tonight and to and to say that uh, um, it's it's part of the requirement to getting to the contract. So what, what we do, John, after we take care of this, and I'm happy to answer questions because Nobleboro had a few questions, um, is to finalize what they call project development, which is what this paperwork is called, and get to a contract so that um, the Office of Community Development can issue a contract with Newcastle. And then Topher um, and his colleagues can begin invoicing for reimbursement. So it's one of those little hurdles that we have to just jump over. I don't want to simplify things, so I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Does anyone have any questions? I, I'm, so I'm just curious, Mary Ellen, is, is there not that, um, I don't take this wrong way, I'm just curious, is there enforcement or review or checks and balances on these forms? I mean, um, how does the state, um, you know, what's the state authority on these? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, not in any ma major way. The only thing they'll do is they'll look to see that you've approved all these when they come to do some, what I would call a very light monitoring. So mm -hmm. probably the most critical thing is just for the town office to be uh, tracking the, the invoices and expenses and rolling out, the, you know, spending, drawing down, if you will, the contract. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, um, no, as far as I know, I've talked to uh, Tammy Knight, the program manager at, at Office of Community Development, and frankly, they're just looking for you, I think if I mentioned this to John, um, in terms of the full, fair housing policy, they want you to upload a very, very not complicated poster. Oops, that's not very good. Sorry about that. Um, very complicated poster to your website and post it in the town office saying that you do business in accordance with the fair housing. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's for, particularly for small towns, that's about it. Yeah. So, so monitoring the dollars and then just posting this fair housing notice. Yeah. Wanda? So it just, I mean, I, whatever we have to do, I guess we have to do, but it just seems like, you know, for what this grant was for, for Split Rock, had nothing to do with housing. I know. Yep. I'm just a little complex as to how one has to do with the other. Um, right, right. It's, it's part of a series of many project doc documents, Wanda, that is required for every community to, to adopt. I will say that HUD from on high has waived some aspects of this process for this quick money, right? This is supposed to get out to the to the business as soon as possible. So the whole time frame has like been three months as opposed to six months, and they've waived the requirement for a special town meeting, um, and a few other small pieces, uh, Wanda. That, that we that the if you live in the CDBG world, you appreciate. But still, they've asked us to uh, for you guys to adopt at least two of these policies, which are not applicable to what you're doing. I, yeah. So. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, I could I could speculate that maybe because the grant is to hire somebody at a certain wage category that the state or HUD would like to see, and it's, and it's not um, it's not a requirement that the person has to come that has to be a resident of Newcastle. But I think that this would say that 
HUD would say, you know, there should be a, um, an opportunity for this person to live in the town um, with that certain wage category and afford housing. You know, maybe that's the only way they can stretch it. Well, I, I, I agree that, frankly, some of this documentation hasn't been reviewed mm -hmm. probably 20 years, you know, so I appreciate that um, the language is a little, you know, not up to date. And uh, uh, again, I, I think from the state agency's point of view, they need to have one package of, of documents that they send out to every town, every, mm -hmm. every community that gets the money. I do want to clarify, though, that, that the... Um, the opportunity for Split Rock to invest in their business, to have them do this great opportunity to have both both lines of their work right now um, supported by these dollars, um, it doesn't require them to hire a Newcastle resident. Mm -hmm. It's it's just required them to pay this person. This is another way that they've shortened the process. Um, it just requires them to pay a decent wage at a certain level, which I can't remember what it is, but it's probably $18, $19 an hour. Mm -hmm which is a decent level and um so it just for 30 seconds worth when we to show you how it's changed when we uh did some work with nc hunt and jefferson when they rebuilt their mill and before that we had to income survey every every employee to make sure that they were low to moderate income or they this was their first job or their a new job they hadn't been working that's been waived we don't have to survey anyone we just um tofer and also the company over in newbleboro has, has said that they will pay people a decent wage and it's, pre, it's a pretty decent wage, 18 to $19. Mm -hmm. um, no requirement uh, that it would be a Newcastle resident. Is that a function of the CARES Act? Or is, is that how it's been implemented uh, like that? Well, this money is all CARES money, um, but the yeah. requirement that people don't have to come from the town where the grant is, has always been there. You don't have to uh, live in the town where the grant is. Um, right. right. It, yeah, sorry, sorry. Though, though it does give the give uh, Split Rock an opportunity to um, to provide more taxable personal real estate there, and and, and uh, um, hopefully more income, and uh, you know maybe they'll hire more than one um, uh, if, if things go well for the next few years anyway. That's all I got. Thank you, and Mary Ellen. Yeah. Yep. John, you didn't have any insight into this that you wanted to relay, or? Uh, no, I mean, I think that I think Mary Ellen went through everything that I saw. I and mean, we went through everything on uh, last week, middle of last week. Um, you know, unfortunately, this is just one of those um, unfortunate aspects of being involved with the grant program that there's a lot of things that, that uh, you know, you, you don't have to sign on to. The, the good part of this is that really all the obligations that they're making are really obligations we already have as a municipality operating in 2020. You know, we're, we're an equal opportunity employer. We comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there's like 90% of everything in that packet. Um, so, you know, these are things we already should be doing. If we haven't been doing them, then, you know, uh, that's something we need to address. But uh, it, it, to me, while it looks like it's more, it's really, it's really just a restatement of what we're already doing or what we should already be doing. So uh, I don't have any concerns with signing on to added policies because they're, they're really a reflection of what we're, where we're, where we're already operating as a town. And are we looking for a motion tonight on this? Yes. Yes, we would. It would be looking for a motion to approve. Um, let's, I'm just, I, you can, you can, approve, you can improve them as en masse if you wished, um, you know, as the slate and, and then uh, assign, or if you want to go one by one. Okay. So it would be the, it would be the standards. So it would be the standards. It'd be equal equal employment opportunity policy statement. The standards, right? The yep standards of conduct. Standards of conduct, and the fair housing resolution. Yep. Is, it, is that all of them? Oh no, and uh, fair yeah. housing self assessment. Yep. The section five hundred four self evaluation transition plan. Yep. And is that it? That's the ADA oh, section the 504, 504, section certification. 504 certification. Yep. And then, and then the my favorite. residential, yeah. the residential yeah. anti displacement and relocation assistance plan. 
<laughs> yeah, that five times fast. <laughs> um, do I have a motion to approve all of those? Um, I'll move. Okay, floor moves. Rob seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? Passes for nothing. And I would um, just like to say I think John should sign it for all of us. I, I don't know that we all have to stop by to sign it. Yep. Do so, you want to amend that motion to authorize John to sign them? I, I think we will need your signatures if there's a way of getting those um, uh, digitally or something. Um, yeah, I can stop them. It's, it's, it's a Word document, so we can put them in if you've got digital signatures, if it makes it easier for you folks. I can do that. I'm not sure yeah. how everybody else is. Yeah. Stop in the office. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, if you, Wanda, if you want, lobby, I'll, I'll... yeah, and Wanda, if, if you want, we can work out something in terms of a digital signature. Um, no, I can, I can so. stop by at some point. Okay. I, I, I apologize. The, I apologize. The forms are the forms. So, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Good. good. Well, moving on, I'm going to move back because I skipped the minutes. So, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yep, Thanks, take Mary care. Ellen. Yep. Thank you very uh, much. I appreciate so we're going to jump back to 3.3.1, uh, the minutes from November 23rd, uh, 2020. Um, we're going to get a motion to move the approval of those minutes. Wanda, I, second. I got a correction. And then, um, I'm not sure the uh, engineer's name, is it, is it Kedrick? I thought it was Hedrick. Yes, it's Hedrick. Yep. Yeah. And one one other correction was um, in the, uh, the the votes vote on the minutes. I actually did vote in in favor of adopting them, for, you know, vocally. So it just it was a uh, five to zero. Yeah, the hard part was we were trying to talk about where you're on the road and how to <laughs> how to oh. do that. But yeah, we'll yeah. we'll 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 uh, we'll make that change. Because late late does have things five zero. So right. Yes. So was yeah, it, we'll get that Rob, cleaned was up. It, Rob, was it you or was it that Bryant wasn't there so he didn't vote on him? Well, I, I, I was, I was, uh, I called in on the phone. No, no, no. But I was, I was thinking that Bryant didn't vote on him because he was, he wasn't at that meeting. Well, that but one said that for that item, it says that, that I didn't vote. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's okay. We can make that change. I don't, that's easy enough. Uh, and, and as Michelle notes above, I mean, she, uh, this is the first time that she had kind of uh, worked through doing the minutes this time. And, and I thought they came out quite well. Uh, and so, you know, as we're, if there's things that we need to tweak and, and, and whatnot, certainly be glad to pass those things along. Uh, yeah. It's, it's always, it's a bit of a process to figure out how to distill what happens in these meetings. <laughs> so, uh, really? but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. right yeah so that's anyway why, that's, that's why i mixed it up tonight and i and i i did the minutes later because i wanted to test test michelle to make sure she was on her toes oh great but i did this on purpose it was she'll be glad to know that yeah <laughs> Keep it fun. all right anything else anyone caught motion to approve um the minutes as amended Move. all okay. right passes four to nothing um, so we'll move on to 5.1, which is the zoning code fee schedule. And um, I think I'll just turn that over to you, Mr. Benjamin Fry. Hey, everybody. Hey. How are we doing tonight? We're here. <laughs> yeah. Where else are we going to be, right? I don't know. Uh, so um, as... Some of you know, some of you guess, making things simple is really complicated. Uh, so this represents an effort. Um, it doesn't have to be the way we go necessarily, but it's um, after a lot of starts and stops, this is kind of where I've landed in terms of um, trying to get us, get us somewhere uh, before the first of the year. Uh, so I sent an email out last night uh, late, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, and then I sent another email right before your meeting with a couple of updates to um, the flowchart and to the um, fee schedule. And uh, so 
I guess in a nutshell, let me just break down sort of what the thinking um, behind this approach is. Um, after having um, lengthy conversations with both Tor and John, um, who I'm kind of putting on sort of polar opposites of the spectrum of this conversation at the moment, um, the distinctions between um, what is an application fee, what is a permit fee, and should there be any fee for uh, a review process, and what is that? It's very confusing right now, as I said before, and I've tried to break it apart. Um, I, I think where I've landed and, and what this represents is that there is a threshold under which, or before which, um, the municipality has a responsibility to review applications um, as part of standard service of the municipality. Um, beyond that threshold, um, and where it is is the question, but beyond the threshold, um, it's reasonable to suggest that there should be some fee for applications that are larger, um, more complicated, um, take more uh, municipal resources to process, be that in terms of time for the CEO or the secretary or the various boards or the communications or the research that happens sort of behind the scenes. Um, those things are hard to quantify in terms of real world costs, uh, but they exist. And we know they exist because some applications are very easy to process. We know that other applications are very difficult to process. And so what I've tried to do is once again, create a flow chart and everyone knows how much fun I have making flow charts um, that could be used by the CEO, by the staff uh, to uh, make a determination about whether the application that they're presented with is um, only needs a basic level of review or if it needs um, a full review. Uh, and that's sort of the dichotomy. And it's not exactly an easy split down the code. Um, so what I've done is I've sort of surgically sliced through the code and I've asked the question, and this is, this is one of the questions I think, you know, before, well, really technically, I guess it's between the CEO and the planning board. Um, but the question really is, you know, what, what qualifies as only needing a basic review and, and what requires more of a full review? Where's that threshold? For you, that question uh, comes across as, um, should we have different levels of fees for those um, two things? And so I've tried to I've tried to represent in the fee schedule um, there for you that um, th that exact idea. And, it, and it's not as simple, I think, as just saying, well, if it's a master plan, it needs a full review. If it's a small project plan, it needs a basic review. And I'm sorry, I need just a second to say goodnight to my daughter. I'll be right back. So Tor, you're one polar opposite and I'm the other apparently. I had no idea about this. Was he playing us off each other? How did this work? <laughs> I mean, in my Zoom portal, you're, we're on opposite ends of the screen. <laughs> Sorry, guys. how that works out. <laughs> yeah. We're just comparing notes, Ben, that you put us on polar opposites. We had no idea about this. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that the conversations I had with you guys were just like, like this. And, uh, and I agreed with both of you. So, you know, that's hard. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, so, what, so what I've done in terms of the fee schedule is to say, um, using the flow chart, which would be a part of the sort of official um, internal policy about how to um, determine, make the determination about applications and their designation, um, that would exist in the office as a policy, not part of the code. Um, just like a fee schedule, uh, it could be modified and changed easily. Um, same with the permit application. And um, and it would be modified as, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I 
had a conversation with John this afternoon and already made an applica a, a, a change to the flow chart to represent a, um, an idea about how subdivision might work. Um, so this is really the beginning of, of, of a way to make that determination. And I guess another part of it is that like, you know, right now, when an, when an applicant comes in to, to do a project, it's actually, I think, very, very, very rare, if unheard of, for them to just come in and drop an application complete, done, ready to go, here you are. Instead, what happens is there's the back and forth of conversations with the CEO and the town staff. Eventually, there's a conversation about, well, how much money is this all going to cost me? And someone has to add it all up, and they have to make a determination about what parts have a fee attached to it. And then the clerk or the deputy clerk has to add that up and say, okay, well, this is how much it costs. But usually I think it's the CEO that does the math. Um, and that's the normal process of give and take. So if someone was to come in and just drop an application in and say, how much do I owe you? The answer would be, we're going to have the CEO look at it and get back to you. And then you can come back with a check after we've determined what that fee is. Um, so there's already that process in place, so that's not going to change at all under under the new core code or with any of this that I've given you tonight to review. Um, it's just that this represents a obviously a, a way of doing it that's tailored to the core code, and hopefully <laughs> is a little simpler. The big thing that I tried to do with the flowchart is give the CEO a tool um, to follow that would help um, the decision tree making process for for the applications so that um, there's less, um, I guess, subjectivity about, well, what needs to go to planning board and what doesn't need to go to planning board, which right now, there's a high degree of subjectivity. Uh, and part of the idea behind the core code and the comprehensive plan is that we're trying to make things simpler for appl applicants to get their stuff processed. So if the, the more tools that the CEO has to say, okay, this project is actually really, you know, basic. Um, we don't need to, we don't need to do a full review on this. Um, I can just process this and we can do it right now, or we can do it in a couple of days when I've reviewed it or whatever. And I don't need outside agencies involved or anything like that. Um, and this just tries to codify that, I guess, and write it down. Um, so if you look at the at the fee schedule, I guess next after you look at the flowchart, the fee schedule. I was having a conversation with Tor a little bit before the meeting, trying to understand where that threshold is um, that I was talking about earlier, um, and sort of where the the distinction between the need or not need for an application fee and um, you know a permit fee, where those are and what they may be. Oops. There we are. Thank you, John. All right. Yeah. Um, this gives the CEO the ability to say, well, you know, there may be a small project plan, for example, um, that is for all intents and purposes, um, very basic. Um, it's just a, you know, single family, um, house, um, you know, on a couple acres of land with a little driveway. There's just this one little extra thing about it that, you know, maybe it's in shoreland or maybe it's um, got some other criteria that actually kind of makes it like, oh, this might not be something that I can do myself, even though the project itself is um, basic. Um, the review process of it may be a little bit more complicated. And so that's what you see under the top table for application fees is the ability to make that distinction between things. The same thing applies for a large project plan. You may have a large project plan that's actually really simple. Large project under the core code is anything over 10,000 square feet. You may have something that's really simple, um, but you may have something that's really complicated. Um, and so that's what one of the things that Tor and I were talking about before the meeting was, um, you know, do we set the threshold on the number of square feet? like the core code does um, or do we set it on this idea of you know for review purposes um, there is the dichotomy of of whether it's a sort of a simple or a, a more complicated 
uh, review process. Um, and then down at the bottom, you know, that hasn't changed. If you're putting in a driveway or a road or a parking lot, uh, or if you're building the different types of buildings that we've got, you know, sprinkled throughout the uh, different districts in the core code, um, those are permit fees. They're not application fees. Um, so those are pretty standard, you know, again, the numbers, set the numbers to whatever you want them to be. They're just in there for a placeholder. Um, and I, I, you know, otherwise I think, I think that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ben? Right off, we got a couple, a tour. So let me just, um, I guess state my polar side of the, um, <laughs> my, my opinion on this. And um, so I think going back to the last meeting or the meeting before we were talking about, I had asked the question, what, what is the town um, generating revenue from building permits on an annual basis? And I, John, I think that number was somewhere around five, yep. let's just say it's five to $6,000 or something like that. Um, which is um, a very small number in the total revenue for the town uh, when you consider um, tax um, commitments. So um, my thought is to um, offer a zero cost permit fee for um, everything that's a small project plan and then simply just everything that's a large um, scale project plan would be um, a fee on a square foot basis, say 10 cents a square foot. Subdivision would be a um, fee, uh, you know, there's a three, uh, by definition of subdivisions, three lot splits or three units. So that would be say $300 and then $100 per unit above that because um, those are the um, those are the plan reviews that um, whether they're at CEO level or go to the planning board are going to be a little more involved they're going to take a few meetings you're going to have some cost with um, secretary um, you know cost of secretary taking meeting meeting minutes um, but I think um, you know obviously it would be less revenue in that line item in the uh in the in the town um you know in the, in the, you know for the town but i think um i just think it's simple i think um i think it's a bold statement to um anybody in town that wants to do something on their house um that says look we, we want you to come in and get a building permit there's no fee if you're going to put an addition on your house but you know you got to fill out a building permit and here's the process um, and um, you know I think it would present um, a good gesture I think it would simplify um, the, the, the questions that the clerks would get I think there wouldn't be so much sort of confusion on what you know how much do you charge for this you know back and forth between CEO planning board chair clerks town manager to try to figure out you know how much is this going to cost and you know, you could chew up an hour of time just trying to chase down how much the fee is going to cost. So um, that's it. I think it would be pretty cost, uh, pretty, you know, pretty simple. Um, let me just give you an example. Um, looking back at Lincoln Academy's uh, development back in 2013 or 14, there, um, there are two buildings, ATEC and Dorm, um, looking back at the fees that were paid to the town were about $12,845, so almost $13,000 in fees for those two projects. I think it took um, probably a few uh, few meetings and planning board, um, design review, there was a couple of meetings. Um, so that's a pretty significant revenue stream for two projects that really didn't take up that much time in the town's sort of overall um, sort of um, you know, commitment of um, processing building permits. If you were to switch it to what I'm saying, um, that fee, total fee would have been about, 50, it's about, it's uh, 10,000 plus 20, 
6,500 square feet. So it would have been about $3,500 in fees. So it's still not nothing, but it's a lot more sort of, um, there's something there, you know. Um, so um, I guess that's it. You know, anybody that wants to build a house, you know, 3,000 square foot house, there's no permit fee. It's a small scale. There's no, um, there's no cost. It's a review by the code officer anyway. Um, if it's in shoreland zone, it has to go to planning board, uh, something like that. Um, my thought is it's probably a meeting with the planning board. Um, so it's probably, um, you know, it's probably a pretty quick process, um, you know, unless it's not conforming and then there's, you know, there's some other math to figure out in the whole, in the whole thing. So, so that's my opinion. Um, you know, take a step forward and it's a bold step, but that's it. And, and under this under this current model, we'd still have the same fee schedule or so, some sort of fee schedule for plumbing permits. And that's not part of any of this. That's just a separate thing. Set by the state. Something so that, we, can, yeah. we can establish our own, but the state sets the plumbing fee schedule as a okay. baseline. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I like the way this is laid out that I, you know, the way it's broken out just to, it, it sort of corresponds with the flow chart, but I, I kind of agree with Tor that the, um, you know, the hundred bucks for a house, it's something, but I just, I kind of feel like it's almost more of a nuisance than anything else. Um, as far as that goes, but I, I can take it or take it or leave it. I don't have hugely strong opinions, but making it making it more appealing for someone to come in for a building permit is, is always a good thing. Um, so, Ben. So um, one of, one of the things just to keep in mind as we're having this discussion is that um, small project plan does not equal residential, and large project plan does not equal commercial. You can have a small project plan that is commercial and requires a very high degree of review or like a lot of review. Um, it could be well under 10,000 square feet, but it could be in shoreland. It could be a subdivision or many subdivisions. It could be a bunch of buildings. It could be a lot of different uses. Um, and I'm not using that as an as a argument against what Tor is saying at all, because I, again, I completely agree um, that basic review should cost little or nothing. However, there needs to be a mechanism to represent or adequately express the fact that um, there are degrees here um, contained within small project plan and within large project plan and even within subdivision um, that are not just a a simple um, thing. We, I, I guess I just don't want to set the fee schedule assuming we're going to get a certain type of development and then all of a sudden we're getting a lot of, of a different type of development and we're not charging anything for it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me, if, if I could just jump in on this because one thing that somewhat shaped the conversations that Ben had and, and I had with Tor as well is the idea that residents to try to create something that that impacts financially impacts residents of Newcastle as little as possible, you know, for the bulk of the permits that we write on an average year, it's decks, it's sheds, um, it's um, you know, small additions. I mean, it's it's really not um, giant uh, projects, you know, and so the idea that that as, as I, my conversation with them is, is, you know, kind of around the idea of yes, saying we don't want to, to impact, you know, someone who wants to build a shed. I think to, to try something with little or no impact financially, no permit fee or, or very little permit fee for the first year, I think is, is a, is a great goal. The concern for me isn't so much that it's, it's the one that goes beyond that, that first, um, you know, instance, you know, we could write a permit for someone building a shed in, in two seconds. That's a, that's a very quick process for the, for the code officer in, in the vast majority of town. 
The problem is, is when you do get into those complicated situations, um, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about, we've got uh, massive components, we've got, um, you know, we've got uh, architectural components, we've got shoreland involved. I mean, this is a situation where now this isn't a 15 minute situation, this is something that's more. And while I think that I want to see that, that you know, we're able to help everybody, the question is really what's the threshold? And um, you know, to go to no permit fee will then a situation where you have a, a, a wildly commercial, uh, wildly commercial, that's overstating, but, but something that's, that's very commercial, very industrial, takes you know, several meetings of a planning board, you know, let's say like the dorms or, or, or NA Tech. Um, you know, that's a situation where should that be on the same level as you know, um, you know, Joe Smith who wants to get a wants to build a deck, you know, the same permit fee. Um, so there's there's equity in that in, in terms of trying to make sure that there's a balance to it. Um, and so, you know, something that's scalable that that kind of goes up but maybe has a higher threshold, um, I think makes sense um, for the town, particularly as a trial. I mean, one thing to say if we had no permit fee. I think that would be a great status for us to be able to say to the residents of Newcastle and to the, to the, you know, Lincoln County and mid coast Maine. Hey, look, we want to try to do this. We know that there, you know, this is a new thing, but we, we believe in it and we want to do this at a, at a, at a low cost to you as low of a cost to you and, you know, move, move for that. I think that's a, that'd be a great, a great step for Newcastle. I'm less, I'm less concerned about the sheds and the decks and the vast majority of projects, it's the one permit that, that you end up talking about every week for four weeks about. Those are the projects that do take up a lot of staff time. And, you know, the sheds and decks are not a problem. I mean, the amount of time we take to calculate the square footage is probably more time than actually what we're recuperating in revenue for that shed or deck. You know what I'm saying? So to Tor's point, he's absolutely right. Like it's crazy, you know, okay, well what, how many cent, how many, so many, you know, square uh, cents a square foot and it's just nuts. So um, I think there's a threshold there. I think you could, you could, you know, dramatically or, or make it zero fee um, if you needed to on a low level. I'm just, I'm more concerned of as they get larger, having some sort of foothold um, for a cell tower or for, um, you know, something that is um, taking a lot of time. And, and just one more note before, just to wrap up, one thing that we talked about is for, you know, FOPO requests, right? So if someone makes, wants to make a request, a free information act request to the town, someone, ha we give the first hour to that applicant for free. That's in state law. So the first hour of that review of pulling documents or whatever is entailed with that, that's free. Beyond that, there's a charge to, to those who are requested of that information. And to me, you know, that how you quantify that, I mean, I think Ben tried to do his best to try to quantify that in some way on here. But the kind of the, the theory that I have is if it takes more than an hour, maybe that's crossed over into a threshold of something that is more than just your simple basic, um, we still call, is it still called basic? Yeah, still uh, basic review. So that was just to kind of give you some of the thoughts that have been out there over the last couple of weeks. So, um, so I guess I'm just thinking that you, there's always, um, there's always you win some and you lose some. So I think, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have large scale development projects that are, um, you know, that are going to go pretty smooth and easily and um you know the fee is going to be something and it's going to be more than that's uh that's more in compensation than or disproportionate into the time that was involved with town planning board the clerks all of the above you have the other you have the others that are going to be like you say john that are going to just take up the oxygen in a room for four months. Um, I mean, I can't think of a project that I've been involved with that's been more involved than the standard when that was being processed through by by two different developers. And, and I wasn't even around for the first time that went through. So 
I think that was like five meetings, um, uh, five months of meetings. The town council was involved for, you know, probably three of those meetings, you know, two hour meetings. So it was a very involved, but it was also a very, um, you know, appropriately, it was a very, it was a very sort of um, important project to the town. Um, so yeah, that one is, that one would be a loss, you know, under my, what I just proposed, that would be like a $1,200 permit fee. Um, so there'd be something there, you know, but you're right. I mean, when you get into paying town council to go to planning board meetings, um, you know, to, to review projects, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you feel like you're, um, you're not necessarily making a gain on it, but, you know, if it's a big enough project, um, in theory, you know, the tax revenue that it's going to generate over time, you know, will offset those costs too. So, um, you know, I think if you look at it, that the town, you know, should make its revenue from um, tax revenue, not necessarily building permits. And we offer this service, the planning boards, volunteer based, um, appeals board is volunteer based, you know, we pay administration. So, um, you know, I just think, um, you know, aside from the secretary trying, you know, that we have to pay on an hourly basis that, um, you know, basically it's everybody's volunteer based. Um, and we do it because we, you know, we have, we, we love the town and that's why, you know, that's why we join these committees and boards is to, you know, is to help out the town, um, so. Can I just draw one quick distinction before Rob? Yeah. I just want to um, just in, the, in this conversation, it's just highlighting for me the um, struggle that I went through mentally um, to draw um, a clear line between what is an application fee and what is a permit fee. And I think they're two very different things and we group them together um, sometimes and it confuses things. So I think what, what we've been debating this whole time is actually application fees. That's like the fee to review. After that review process, and let's say you're granted the permit, you then have to pay the permit fee, which is the fee for like doing the building, right? Um, we've kind of traditionally rolled it all up into one, but um, you know, ideologically, they're actually two separate things. Um, and, and I think this whole conversation so far has been around the idea of um, just application fees, not permit fees. So um, it took me forever to get there. I'm sorry. But um, I, I think that's really what we're talking about is how much should the town charge, if anything, to review an application? After which there's a cost to get the building permit. Just to be clear, uh, I'm proposing that it's zero on both sides of that. So um, up to up to 10,000 square feet. So I, I like the, um, in principle, I like the, the approach of the flow chart. Uh, I'm thinking that um, as we get going, maybe it's just a, an, an additional complication to the process. And that uh, the question is, would we be comfortable saying no application fees for the first six months for any projects, learn how we actually um, administer applications and revisit the, how, to, how to decide between simple basic projects and projects that require um, more involved um, review and therefore maybe have a, have a, a, a fee or a higher fee. Um, I, I, you know, I just feel like we're, we're, we're learning, we're going to be learning so much about administering this code that I, it feels like we're not really ready to, to define all that. And if we're trying to implement that, flow chart, maybe that just slows us down and we should just focus on the review of the applications for now while thinking that six months down the road, we're going to know a lot more. We can uh, do a, whether it's a flow chart or some other mechanism for deciding between the level of review and therefore the level of application fee. Um, that might, I mean, that feels like 
we're not really ready to define that. Um, and then secondly, the, the question, I, I, I think that that distinction between application fee and permit fee is a really good one. And, and I, I, would, I would lean towards thinking, hoping that as we learn how to administer the code, that we can keep the application fees very low um, going forward, even after the six months of learning how to do it. Um, and then I, I, I frankly have to still think about what the, what the, what the goal and point of the, the, the permit fee is and what the appropriate level for those are. I, I'm not, I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> but I think that the application fees, I, I would, I, the question is, do we feel comfortable saying no fees for six months so that we can try this out? And I guess, John, maybe that's partly a question for you. Um, administratively, does that feel scary? No, I, I don't think it's scary. I, I, I mean, I frankly think that there's there's a way that, um, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, to your point, you know, the, the permit fees as listed on here, um, you know, those, if you, if you did without permit fees, and really just talked about review of application fees, uh, that pretty much meets the standard of, I, I think, what we're looking at apart from a handful of items. So that may be partially where you're headed in terms of what you were saying a moment ago, Rob, I don't know. Um, I don't, to me, I'm not, I'm not concerned about, you know, as I said, the decks, the sheds, um, even single family dwellings, maybe to some capacity, I, that, that, that doesn't concern me at all. What, what concerns me is, um, just that an incredible amount of staff time can be staff, um, uh, external, uh, um, uh, technical assistance, um, whether that be legal or, or engineering or what have you. I mean, it can go a, a pretty wide range of things, um, you know, should, talk about uh you know subdivisions um so my point is is just that i think that there's a subset of things that are um are very time consuming um very very important and and also we want to avoid a situation where um people merely are throwing applications out without any cost to them you know maybe that's a speculative you know idea but um, to me, the idea of, I, I'm just not at all concerned about the, the sheds and the decks. I, I, to me, like, that's the, the focus to me of, of the low permit fee, because that's the vast majority of them. That's the place where we'll get comfortable. That's where most people who are walking in the door, may be skeptical or concerned that the town is going, doing something, um, new with this code. How's it going to work? Um, you know, that's the majority of our residents that will be impacted. And so, to me, that's those are the people who, who, if we can avoid a permit fee in that regard, that's a that'd be a, a great thing. Um, you know, someone who's you know maybe putting a new cell tower up, perhaps. I'm less dis less concerned, you know. But and I don't mean to draw you know these kind of wide distinctions, but um, I just view I, I don't view it as it helps the keep the town you know budget in any way. To me, if we if we collected zero fees, I'm less concerned with it. I'm more concerned with ensuring that we are people are paying for for that level of review, and you know whether it's the time that we're doing taking to make sure that the planning board has all the materials or uh, that that our CEO has um, has done a proper job that we're training them properly. I mean, there's I think there's other things you buy with that permit fee than with the piece of paper that it's signed. And so to me, that's what that fee purchases. It purchases a, a substantial review and a review of, of value. Um, I don't think that that people feel that need when you're putting up a shed, <laughs> you know, I don't think, oh, great, I got a permit. But if I went through a subdivision, I'd want to make sure that, okay, that there's a, there's a, a plan and everyone got their packet and they've looked at the, okay, yep. And, and the board has gone through and the CEO has looked at it and said, make sure that they've delineated their wetlands. And that message goes to the planning board. I mean, those are part of ensuring a proper process to me. It's I, less about that than anything, you know, than the other. 
And I guess my, my concern is, I mean, I think that the flow chart is a way to make that distinction, mm -hmm. but it by itself, as Ben said, trying to keep it simple becomes complex. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, you know, a Tor's idea of 10,000 square feet is a simple way of having a distinction, but many of the examples you just gave would be simple under that 10,000 square feet, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how we, how we stay simple and meet, you know, the, the distinction we're trying to get. I think, um, yeah. you know, I think where you have subdivision, large, you know, large, you know, anything, like I said, 10,000, the only reason why I say 10,000 square feet is because our code delineates small project and large, it's, it's written in our administration section. So that's where I get that number from. Um, and so I think it would be nice to have something that correlates exactly to the administration section of the code. That way you can say to somebody, you're going through large plan, um, you know, review, you know, here it is, this is the fee for it. I guess in my mind, that sounds simple. Um, you know, the other thing I want to say is, you know, there's a difference between, um, John Q resident that wants to build the addition, the deck, the shed or put, a, um, put up a new house on their property. And then there's a difference between that person and a developer that's doing a sub, you know, a 10 lot subdivision, uh, you know, in addition to a commercial building or 20,000 square foot um, commercial building. Um, I don't feel the need, the town has to subsidize a commercial developer. Um, but I do think the, the, the resident that wants to do something, um, it should be easy and it should be very cheap, if not free. Yeah. So um, just kind of going back to the flow chart, I mean, I think this is, this is all really good conversation and I don't know how to get to a, um, a decision here, but the, um, the thing that, uh, the thing that kept tripping me up are the exact same things that we're talking about um, and how to, how to draw that, that line because um, you could, for example, at, um, if the 10,000 square foot, you could have a simple subdivision of, you know, four 2,000 square foot houses and fall well under the 10,000 square foot, um, you know. And so is there no application review fee for that project? And so it seems like we're trying to capture the idea that a simple, um, a simple, sorry, not a simple, but a small project plan on the low end is just a simple house or a shed or a deck or something, right? Um, but it's also potentially, you know, literally a 9,500 foot warehouse um, in the shoreland, um, you know, with, with like four different uses or something. Like that requires a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, potential uh, review so um yeah but it's, but it's review by people that are volunteering to review it it's not re it's not necessarily being reviewed by yes the ceo is involved with it but but really the ceo should recognize that that's planning board review and put it to the planning board um so that's my point um I, yeah i guess um i i think rob has got a good point is to, um, you know, reassess. I mean, I don't think our job right now tonight is to approve flow charts and um, applications and, and all of that sort of document. It's to come up with a fee schedule, um, or, you know, what we think is the right plan. I think if we, um, you know, I thought maybe the first year we would see how it goes if you want to do six months, you know, maybe something like that. But I think, um, you know, begs to be reassessed, that's for sure. Um, you know, we can change it. We can change it next year if we have to, um, but, um, or maybe six months, six months from now. It, ben, um, or everyone, I had a, just my question. In terms of the permit fees, um, the con new construction permit fees at the bottom, if, I mean, those, those are very much based upon what is built, 
you know, um, what is constructed, what is being added um, in terms of the items that we're taxing effectively, right? Um, the additional application fees, which is that second section of items, the idea is that those that review of those items effectively is is lumped into the application fee of what's above. So I'm I'm ignoring in part the flowchart for a second. Yep. But if if you <laughs> could argue that perhaps the additional application fees maybe were addressed in some way, you know, Shoreland, Stormwater, you know. Some maybe some maybe maybe it's all zero or maybe some just have a, a modest amount. Mm -hmm. um, maybe those address the concerns in part uh, of of what we're talking about in terms of that scalability of it. You know, because if if we said zero on a project plan and we didn't charge anything for any construction, um, you know, effectively there'd be no fee for. I mean, we could say a ten dollar fee. We, I mean, we could whatever, 50 cents, whatever the number is, a modest amount like that. Um, for for any any project, you know, any shed deck, what have you, any single family dwelling, perhaps. But if it's in the shoreland, okay, now that's, a, that maybe that's, you know, what was, what was for you in terms of you, as you were creating that, what was it that separated out the permit fees of new construction as, as a way to kind of allow for a zero, um, on the small project plan side. Well, so the, like you said at the beginning, the single unit residential, multi-unit residential, those re represent the different building types, um, you know, of actual construction in the code. That That's your building permit, which is another term that we we'll use very, very loosely. Um, but essentially that's your building permit. Um, and I, I don't think anyone here has been arguing that maybe there shouldn't necessarily be any zero fee for you know, building permit, I mean, building permits always carry some degree of, of fee with it. Um, it's the application part of it. Um, and I'm, I just, you know, I stuck it, I stuck it. I don't care how we do it. I'm just trying to make some sense of it. Honestly, I really don't care. I, I, <laughs> I would love to be not thinking about this anymore, <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you, because it's keeping me up at night. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I just think we have a simple, sorry, Rob. Yeah, go ahead. I just think we have a, we have a simple code. We have something that is blindingly simple compared to the ordinance that we have now. Um, I think, I think our, I, 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 I think the, the actual flow chart is actually written into the administration section in the code itself. So I think, um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think having a flow chart assists could be confusing to um, CEO. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't studied it too well then, but um, I think we tried to create a flowchart before it can, because you can't always think of every single scenario where you're gonna have somebody coming into a process and how do you present, push them forward? And so there is that level of communication with the CEO that says, okay, now I understand what you're doing. You have to do this. So. Um, to have that sort of delineated in a you know one page document, I think is really, and I can see your frustration in that. That would be really hard to sort of comprehend. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing. I think, um, like I said, our code is pretty simple. Um, I think as we get used to it, I think we'll see that it actually performs well. And um, you know, that's that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I think. I mean, based on this discussion, I I think. You know, having you guys make the decision to, you know, not have any application fees for anything for six months or a year, like, awesome, great. But to John's point, if you don't have some fee on the building side of it, on what's actually being built, um, then you're kind of, you're going to. I think I think that's that's opening the floodgates w f far far too wide, and the problem with the only problem that I foresee with any of that is rolling back. Is once you give once you give something <laughs> away for free, and then later decide you're going to charge for it, 
it's difficult. So, so um, perhaps a way um, to deal with this is not to go to, to zero in this, even in this test period, but not try to have the basic and full distinction. But as John was, was suggesting, add some fees to the additional things. So we've got the, you know, the, the application fees based on the project type. And then we've got the additional fees that are added to that, um, if it's a shoreland, et cetera. And there's, then it's, it very much follows the structure of the code. There's not judgment about whether it's meeting a threshold or not. And, and we will revisit this in six months or a year. Yeah, I could do a, um, I could do, I mean, that's what I kind of what I had before, but I, I could do another fee schedule that just eliminates the distinction between the basic and the full sets the um, small project plan application fee at zero um, right. has application fees for large project subdivision master plan so on and so forth yes yes and then um, you know nominal fees for additional application fees such as shoreland stormwater erosion sediment control things like that right nominal twenty five dollars you know why would you set the <clears throat> shoreland at twenty five dollars if that's oh I was thinking more stormwater sediment um, shoreland should probably be like a hundred yeah. that's pretty standard for planning board like if you have to visit the planning board most towns charge a hundred dollars yeah Wanda do you have any thoughts on this I know we're kind of staring we're staring in a mud puddle <laughs> yeah. we're looking deep in it I know I'm channeling Carolyn yeah exactly <laughs> she's shaking her head right now um I I I have to say that I I kind of I'm I'm with Tor on this where I think, I think making it, you know, it, it, if we did, if we did have those additional application fees thrown in there, but if someone was going to build, build a house, I, I mean, I, I don't know what would keep us, what was the difference between $25 and $0, except that you have to get out your checkbook and unless there's some legal legal reason why we'd have to have money changing hands to make some sort of a contract between the town and the person a viable thing. I, I don't see a, I don't see a huge, huge gain in it um, in any way. Uh, and, and then I, I, I think as things progress, what's going to end up happening is uh, people are going to be coming into town office saying, I want to build an addition or I want to build a deck. And the, the people in the front office, once they're also comfortable with the code, they're going to help the people get the right application. They're going to help them fill it out. It's going to go over to the CEO's desk. It's going to sit there. They're going to look. They're going to look at it and say, "Yeah, this is good. Fine, do it." You know. So. Um, the one thing I'd say, Joel, um, the the distinction is that once you actually get once you get a permit, um, you you have the rights to that permit for the period of time for which the permit is good. So one year, right. um, if you can acquire those rights for nothing, then it takes very little effort to get something for nothing. And I know it's not, it, it may be a nominal fee, but if there's a fee attached to it, you're buying those rights for a period of time to do a project, whether you do the project or not, you're buying the rights to do that project for that length of time. Um, but how does, Ben, how does that apply in, in real life? So I'm just trying to think of the scenario where I want to build a house on my lot. Um, it's 2,500 square feet. Um, doesn't require planning board review. Um, it's in a rural district. I go and I talk to um, Ken, sit down with him, um, figure out, you know, he says, yeah, you can do this, no problem. You're not infringing on setbacks. So you're, you're all set, you know, it works out you know, with coverage, all that stuff. So, um, so you're saying, um, he says, yeah, you can do it. I fill out the application. Um, and then he says, okay, now you got to pay me so much dollars for the permit that I'm going to hand you. So, um, I mean, 
I'll answer your question truthfully, but I'll also answer it as someone who knows the code really well and could abuse zero dollar application fees. So if I've got 25 acres of land and I know that I can divide that using virtual lot lines and I don't have to go through subdivision and I don't have to do anything, I could get, I could acquire the rights to build 25 houses for zero dollars and that would be good for a year. But that would be a subdivision. No. For I'm just acquiring hours. the rights to do it. I haven't actually done it and I wouldn't need to do it until I actually went to do it. Well, you'd have to file for a, you'd have to file for a, uh, you'd have to file an application to do that. Sure. And you'd have to, right? Yeah. So but that would be, that would be 25. That would be a subdivision. That would be 25 units. No, I'm doing it with virtual lots, not actual subdivisions because oh, well. I don't have to file subdivision until I make the third one. Mm -hmm. and like, idea you like, could make I the money have, off of, yeah. Yeah, until I actually make the third deeded split, I don't have to do subdivision legally, but I could acquire the rights for 25 or 100 for, for zip. But if you, the truth, it would yeah. cost you $2,500 if you were to do it the other way, which is still to build 25 houses is, I mean, I'm just saying with the difference between zero and 2,500 is. Well, okay, but look at it this way. I'm a crafty developer and I've been watching this video <laughs> and I know that you guys are going to set the application fee at zero and I, I want to acquire the rights to build a hundred houses on a hundred acres of land in Newcastle. Now, before you implement higher application fees, I'm going to buy those rights for nothing and later sell them to another developer after you've implemented application fees when they're worth more. I mean, there's lots of ways that it could be gamed. I'm just saying like, yeah, we can't not do nothing and not have consequences. What, There's, I guess, there is value, I guess, even if we don't think that there is, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I guess what I'm trying to encourage is for people to feel comfortable with getting, coming in and getting a building permit for building a shed. When I first, when I first moved here, I, you know, after a couple of years, I built a shed and I, I figured out what it was you needed to build the shed at before. So you didn't need a, a building permit. And I built it within that. And in, in, retrospect once i went in and talked to you know the, the assessor's agent about it he says you know just because you didn't have a building permit for it doesn't mean it's not a taxable structure and that's what people think that they're people think that they're gaming the town they say well this is a ta this is a tax free structure because i i don't it, it you know i didn't get a building permit for it so if i didn't get a building permit it's not taxable and and what that ended up being is that I could have built a much more useful shed that would have been the size that I kind of needed to, to, to use. And it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have uh, affected my tax bill any, any differently than it currently does. And I would have been educated. So I'm just trying to get people in the mindset of yeah, you're going to do something, you got to come and get a building permit for it, but it's a really simple process. It's not going to cost you anything and you're going to get educated on this kind of stuff. And, and that's what it is. Um, you know, how much is your shed going to cost you? You know, it should be one of the questions on the application. Okay. It's got no foundation. There's no dirt work. You're just building it on piers and skids. It's for storing your lawnmower and some wood, you know, it's going to cost you, you know, a few hundred dollars in materials you've got kicking around that's fine you know so it's kind of things like that or again and i've had questions about i'm gonna put a little overhang on something do i need a building permit for this and you know if i need to get a building permit right now it's a minimum fee of this and that and it, it just makes it very unappealing to do it and i'd rather have people come in get the information so that so that so that they know and we know what's going on and and they don't build something thinking that they're compliant 
only to find out that they're not, and it would have been a simple thing before they built it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the zero, the zero fee comes in. And then, you know, if you got to get out your checkbook to, you know, write a 20, I mean, I, I write so few checks, I, I have a hard time finding personal checks when I need personal checks. So, I mean, I would just, I would throw that out there as a, this is, this is why we're doing it is to try and get, we want to see more applications. You know, we want to see more people saying, I'm putting this on. Do I need to, do, you know, what do I do? And then, yeah, let's fill out an application for building this little overhang over your door you know you know little little roof over something but that's my i gotta grab a battery charger my computer's about to die i'll just say i think i think we're all on that same page that we really want to make it easy simple for for the majority of these low impact homeowner projects um we're just trying to make sure we don't leave ourselves open for the the projects that, that really take a whole bunch of time. And I think that, you know, I, I'm inclined for this first period to err on the side of making it easy for the majority of people. And, you know, if something slips through, then we'll know to revise things to catch it um, in the future. Because I, I don't imagine we're going to get a lot of, you know, things happening that, that, uh, that we can't capture with you know, with our, with a, with a simple structure here. Um, I mean, there, there probably will be something, but then we know, okay, we need to catch that in the future. I don't want to make it too complicated to start, I guess is the. So, um, all right, I'll do another revision and come back to you guys in two weeks. Does that, does that work? I'll, t I'll take it at this conversation and see if I can simplify it even more, I guess, and, and come back. And at that point, we'll need to be ready to adopt something. Yes and no. I mean, if you adopt it the first meeting in January, it's not the end of the world. True. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. I, 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 think you, I think you really, it really would be a good idea to have application forms and, and everything in place. Um, but you know, I, the other thing I'd say is, in terms of question is to me, to me, it's about the new construction permit fees. As I'm, as I'm hearing people, I mean, if, if we want to say that there's no fee or low fee for accessory buildings, $25 too much, too little, what have you. I mean, that to me is, it's all about those new construction permit fees um, because the review end, which is the application part, is really, um, it doesn't affect most people, right? I mean, that's that's really, that's not really so much the concern. It's really about those those con new construction permit fees. That's what someone's going to come in and pay. So, so this this is this is this is good. This is good. What what I'll do is I'll make you know, another fee schedule based on the idea, and I'll leave the application fees up top the first table the way they are, but they'll just be zeroed out for now. Okay, but they'll be a placeholder. And then under permit fees, I'll expand the permit fees down below to include some of the things up above, like mm -hmm. subdivision, master plan, you know, large and small um, project plan, like Tor was saying. And there'll be a permit fee attached uh, to maybe that portion of it or those things that need to be have a permit fee. And maybe some of them are zero and some of them have a fee. Um, and maybe that fee is like you know, the, the subdivision um, idea that Tor had, you know, um, a flat fee for the first, would you say three, and then a certain amount for every- 300, lot. 100 for each additional. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. It's a great idea. Um, and then, you know, we go from there and then run for however, how long you guys want to run for with, you know, zero application review fees and just have permit fees. And, and so then we could easily say and show that single unit, unit residential buildings, which is your typical house, uh, is either zero dollars or a nominal fee. Um, an addition to an existing building is zero dollars or a nominal fee. Um, those things like, you know, um, accessory, residential accessory building, commercial accessory building, you know, it'd be very easy to just show that 
you, you have to pay the permit fee, but there's no fee for the application. But we'd reserve the right later to review that and say, um, this actually needs an application review fee in the future. Does that, does that get at what we're talk, all talking about? I, I, yeah, I'm, I, just, I'm still okay. sorry. No, I'm just wondering how we, um, <laughs> at the end of the, we still have to come up with some numbers here, right? And I think it's our job as the DOS to, to, to come up with some numbers to um, give to John. Is that right, John? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's not plan Amberlord, it's not John's idea. It's, it's, it's BOS needs to come up with some figures. That's what we need to vote on at the end of the day. So um, I think if somebody wants to present those numbers and you know, I've, I've stated my case, um, let's just do it. I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about a line item that's either $5,000 or somewhere in between zero, zero and 5,000. So, um, you know, I think let's, um, I, I, don't, I don't wanna overthink it. I think we just need to come up with some numbers and, and put it forward. I think we're all on the same page and let's just, uh, and, you know, wrote on some dollar figures at the next meeting. That's my wish is not to drag this out two more meetings and keep on talking about $25 or a hundred dollars or $0. So. And, and I, I would, I would say, I was actually thinking that we wouldn't go to zero <laughs> now for the um, application fees, but something like very similar to the basic numbers in the table that you did and then yes, revisit the uh, permit fees and get a little bit more granularity in there. But I'll tell you what I'll do. <laughs> I'll put the form together and I'll leave it blank and I'll give it to you guys and you guys can fill in the numbers. <laughs> okay. Let's do that. I think that's, I mean, honestly, I think that's our job. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll do that. Really? Yeah. I'll do that. So, um, let's just do that. I'll send that out tomorrow and, yeah. and then you guys can worry about the numbers. Right. Yeah. Great. We can all, we can all submit our numbers to John and he can average them out. And... <laughs> oh my gosh. $17 and 33 cents. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to go guys. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one. Thanks Ben. Yeah. Bye. All right. So, Moving on to 5.2, uh, Comprehensive Plan Implementation Committee. Well, this this really only came back because we had discussed this at a, at a previous meeting. I don't know that we the ball has moved anywhere on this, so I'm not really sure there's much to talk about. Um, basically, that we had talked about this, this group as well as um, the Historic Preservation Potential Ordinance. There's, there was some conversation about that. Um, so given the last conversation, perhaps it makes sense for this to be something that happens in January, but, um, clearly, you know, this was something that we had, or this is something that, that we had discussed at a prior meeting. And, um, if we wish to, uh, move forward in putting a group together, we need to create some sort of a mission statement, find members and so forth. So that's really why this is on the agenda. Um, and, and really it's a question as to what is, what sort of direction do you want to take in terms of creating a committee or do you want to wait and perhaps ponder this some more and wait until January or, but it was just, was kind of sitting on the table and needed to, it needs to move somewhere, I guess. Sure. John, do you have a, um, do you have a, um, report, I guess it is from the state? on our comp plan? Yeah, I have, I have a, you know, it, it, there was a, a series of, I want to say a half dozen items that needed to be revised in the comp plan that the NLPC had worked on um, and had been approved by the town. So we have that to work from. Uh, but in addition, you know, so I think the idea of at least in terms of my thoughts, in terms of what this comp plan implementation committee, their first job, potentially could be to one, make the changes that the state requested um, so we could get full compliance Two, make the changes to the document. So be in compliance with the character code or excuse me, the core zoning code. Um, and then 
Of course, there may be some changes to the core zoning code that may have to happen out of this, but we'll put that aside. And then three, probably most importantly, which is more traditionally what a comp plan implementation committee's job is, would actually be to, to go out and seek out the adoption of a lot of the policies and thoughts that we'd put into the NLP, the NLPC had put into that document. Um, there were so many things. I mean, there's, I mean, we're talking about 60, 70, a list of 60 or 70 action state, action steps that the town could take to accomplish largely the big ideas, but also there were other items within particular neighborhoods uh, to start to, to move things forward. And so the idea of that would be third on the list, but that's really probably the one that will drive people to want to do, the, do this because that's actually the um that's the fun part you know that's the part of actually trying to make the community better um the rest is living in in, in paperwork but but we got to get through those first two steps i would think um to make this comp plan really something that can work live and breathe on its own and and then hopefully be the type of document we can use with the dot and with dep and and then fisheries and whoever else con conservation forestry um to accomplish some of the the pretty broad um, and high-minded goals we have in there. Um, I think there's a lot of great stuff that's in that plan. Um, and unfortunately, it's really been sitting for two years because we've been so focused with the core zoning code. But, you know, to really revitalize that downtown, you know, business everywhere. I mean, all those great ideas that were part of it. The only way it's going to happen is if, you know, either the Board of Selectmen says we're going to be the comp plan implementation committee, which I would not recommend, um, Certainly members of the board of selectmen could do that, do be part of that group. But I think you need an outside group who are pushing and cajoling and trying to, to help you. Um, and I, I say this and I'm looking at my screen and all four of you were in those NLPC meetings. So you know what I'm talking about. And I'm sure you don't want to jump back into those waters, but there's just so many great ideas that are in there. It's just a shame to have it sit on an eye on a shelf somewhere, you know? I, I think maybe maybe if we broke it out to the to the tasks uh that you first mentioned the ones that are that are more pressing and and kind of should be taken care of before we and, and and try and keep that a smaller group the people who if we can if we can get someone back or a few people back who are on the other committee to go through it because they're they're familiar with both documents and how it works and can make the recommendations and we could get that part of it done and then sort of expand that group to larger people in the community to 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 take part in those other those other elements because what i'd be afraid of doing i mean we just had how long was our conversation about uh fees on building permits um that's the kind of stuff that happens when you get a large you know large group of people involved where I don't, I don't, I don't want it to turn into a thing where we're, you know, starting over with our comp comp plan. We need to clean it up, get it, get it set, get it approved by the state, and um, adjusted to our to our current ordinance, and then and then go from there. So, I think if we kept that mission statement simple, and then tasked a group with that it might be it might be a better way to actually get something done john can you distribute that uh that list from yeah i can um, i can grab the one from the state in terms of yeah their... just, it's sometime in the next you know between our next meeting um, yeah sure yeah you got it i think i think uh, joel's idea makes sense i mean i think uh, it, it i don't think we want multiple entities, but I think if the committee can start out small, um, a sort of a, a technocratic, make those fixes, and then broaden um, to be more of the, the implementing the vision. I think that makes a lot of sense. Because um, I'm also thinking that we, we have, we, we also have the historic preservation committee work. And I don't remember if there's another committee we've been sort of thinking about, but we're going to have to find people to, to serve on these committees. And, and that's uh, not always easy. Right. So is it something we want to bring back at the next meeting and maybe play around with the scope of 
send send John some of our ideas on the scope of work and how many how many members do we need to have on a committee like this, John? Is there a um, no? I mean, I, I would say your traditional five to seven um, yeah. would be the the right number. I think. Yeah, the 13, 14, 15 person LPC. I mean, as you said, this is really you know, kind of sitting down and and there's there's two really two stages. There's the going back and editing and looking for consistency parts and mixing making some some minor changes in terms of uh, what the states requested. But the bigger issue really is the how do we go out there and get these things done. So um, to me, that's the that's the fun part. That's the part where you probably could maybe broaden the committee at that point. Maybe you keep it to five and then you broaden it to seven. And, you know, so you have more, more voices. Um, you know, the, the, the committee in itself won't have any authority other than to, you know, to approve things and bring things to board to the, the board of selectmen or to me or to the planning board or whomever. But, but the really, that's the, that's the power is that there's an engine driving this. Um, and right now there's, you know, we have our, our meetings, but, but to have an outside group who are similarly interested and engaged, I think is, is really what the reason why you have these implementation committees. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's, um, yeah, I think five to seven is great. Could, could it be as few as three if, if we couldn't find the commitment from five people in the beginning? Sure. That's all I'm thinking. I'm just, yeah. all four of us were on the, on various different committees involved with this. And um, there's a lot of tired people who don't really <laughs> want to come back and do it. But if it was something simpler, we might be able to get um, get some people to sign on. And, and again, it's, it's easier to work in a smaller group, especially remotely um, and to coordinate. So I don't know if people have ideas of you know, recommendations, or we could talk to people or reach out, see if we could get this part at least going, and then not not sit on it too long, and then sort of develop that mission statement for the broader, broader committee. I think Rob said it, technocratic aspect of it, which is sort of the step one, and I think, along with what Joel's thinking, you know, a few people that kind of know the code, uh, know the comp plan, um, you know, to implement what the state needs. And I think we just want to be careful that we don't have a big group that thinks that this is time to rewrite the comp plan and right. get into to a small snowball discussion on, you know, all the aspects of the comp plan. Um, you know, I think we need to get it um, technically, we got, need to make it what it needs to be and then get the implementation crew together. But I, I agree, it's two steps. Okay. So is that clear, clear, clear for you, John? You know exactly what to do now. I think so. Yeah. Yep, I do. <laughs> so I guess maybe we'll we'll talk about this the next meeting. You guys want to carry it forward, bring it bring it up at the next meeting with some recommendations, or we want to reach out to people, and or do we want to discuss it next meeting? Does anyone? I think yeah, our goal should be to uh, to be able to have a, a charter for the phase one, yeah, and and try to see if we can drum up some interest in the meantime. Okay, can we uh, just use download those names to John and have that discussion with John and you present the you know maybe a potential committee at our next meeting. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. All right, does anyone have anyone else, anything else on this? Nope. Okay, uh, moving on to the town manager report and communications. Um, did anyone have any questions for John or John, do you have anything you wanted to highlight or? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's all in there. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, um, so moving on to the town warrant for uh, 237,639 and 71 cents. We have a motion to approve. Motion. Right. Second. Second. Wanda, any discussion? 
Okay. All those in favor of approving the warrant? Passes for nothing. And you got nothing else. We'll move on to executive session under uh, uh, MSRA section 4056C for real estate. A motion to go into executive session. Move. Um, second. Second. Wanda, all in favor? All right. 